So, unfortunately for you, Fan, I am telling this story. So, my tribe wins the war. I put my spear up against Fan's throat, and I say, Fan, you're now my slave. Here's a question, folks. What is my ethical, intellectual justification to enslave Fan? Mike makes right. Mike makes right. Mark, it's the spear and nothing further, right? Here's the kicker. Race gets created as a construct, as a ridiculously stupid way to try to justify intellectually the depraved institution of slavery and even further the outrageous idea that you should enslave people for no reason other than pigment. It's incredibly stupid. It's incredibly perverse. It's sick. And yet, that construct was used and created on purpose. Another way to say it is that racism, imperialism, and corporatism are inextricably linked concepts. And in fact, folks, I am not the first American to say that. I will tell you that one of the great American political thinkers and orators said basically the same thing in what I believe is his best political speech. It's not his most famous speech, because his most famous speech is... I have a dream. Who am I talking about? The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And Dr. King's most famous speech is I have a dream. But for my money, his best speech was actually not delivered in Washington, D.C., but in Harlem. And was not delivered to a rally of 10,000, but instead was delivered to a congregation at Riverside Church. That speech is known as Beyond War or Beyond Vietnam. Oh, I'm so glad that some of you know that speech. Because in that speech, the doc Dr. King outlined the fact that the United States of America was suffering from a spiritual and moral decay. Because we are gripped, he said, by triple evils of racism, militarism, and extreme materialism. And unless and until America came to terms with those triple evils, we would never be the country that we deserve to be or we aspire to be. And sisters and brothers, may I say, Dr. King was right then and he's right now. Unless and until we go through a process of engaging with racism, corporatism, militarism, we can never actually usher in the world that so many of us want. In fact, that the majority of Americans want. And I'm here to tell you folks that that world is being ushered in. And one of the places where it's being ushered in, i got to say, is at a little movement called Occupy Wall Street. And i got to say, it's a genius idea, Occupy, on so many levels. Number one, you know, I, I was part of the global justice movement in the, in the 90s, and we went to, the, to Seattle in 1999. You know, me and about 50,000 of my closest friends descended there. And, you know, we shut down the World Trade Organization. Y'all might have heard of that, right? That was a wonderful thing. Yeah, and thank you for that. But the difference is, see, we were going and following where the <coughs> mighty, powerful corporate elite were meeting. But then when they left, we left. The difference in Occupy Wall Street, it, I think, are worth pointing out. Number one, Occupy Wall Street had the genius of saying... We're going to actually go to the heart of where Wall Street exists because Wall Street is not Main Street. And we understand that. And this is where the banksters and the corporatists and the militarists are making the real decisions. And we're not going away. We're staying right here. And the genius was, if you can't get to Wall Street, you can occupy wherever you live where it can play. After all, the tagline is, Occupy Together. Occupy everywhere. And I gotta say, as brilliant as all those things are, and each one of those are brilliant topics, the other thing that's brilliant, that's even deeper and more profound, is that Occupy Wall Street is daring us and challenging us to occupy our own imagination space. To actually remember that we've got power. To actually remember that we actually could make the world anew. And may I lastly say about Occupy Wall Street, how about the fact that it's led by 20-somethings? Yeah. Oh my goodness, it is so beautiful to me. I've been to about 20 Occupy encampments, and every time I roll up, and I do so with humility and gratitude for what they're doing, 
But every time I do it, it's almost always 20-somethings, sometimes teenagers, you know, sometimes people in their 30s. It is intergenerational to be sure, but the overwhelming majority of them are young people. And I think that's a beautiful and brilliant thing. And so since we're now we're talking about America, I'm going to go back to my history lesson and ask this question. How many original colonies in the United States of America? 13. That was a gimme, y'all. So here's the real question. How many of those original 13 colonies were actually corporations? Actually, it's a trick question. All of them. How? What do I mean? Well, I will tell you that all of them because the king had to give them body. The king had to create them. See, it's a trick question. The king created Massachusetts. Now, some of you may say, that's not true. Massachusetts was already there. To which I say, that's why it's a trick question. The land was there. The people were there. The forests and the rivers and the streams and the mountains. You know, physical reality was there. But it took the king to create Massachusetts. And when the king created Massachusetts, the king did so by use of a legal document known as a charter. Massachusetts Bay Colony. So, when the king creates Massachusetts, he does so with a charter. And in order to actually tell this, I'll use a little exercise, as by, and I'll illustrate it this way. Uh, in this story, I'll be the king, and why would I be the king? Because I'm telling the story. All right. Hey, you catch it on? All right, so I'm telling the story, and so now, man, it'll be good to sit where you sit, because I'm going to make you a governor. Watch this. I, the king, who have ultimate authority, the sovereign over all, will now describe this land, this new area, and I will create Massachusetts. And I will do so by creating and writing a legal document known as a charter to give birth to this entity. And I will not bother with governing on the day-to-day -day basis. After all, I'm the king. I have other people to conquer and other people to exploit and other resources to steal. So instead, I will appoint a royal crown governor. And in this case, and I'll quote directly now from the actual charter of Massachusetts, quote, to plant, to rule, and to govern in my name, on my, to my benefit, and to benefit the shareholders of the joint stock company known as the Massachusetts Bay Trading Colony. You see, folks, most of the original... Uh, colonies in their charters were actually created as for-profit corporations. Instruments of the same colonial process. And in fact, when you think about it, if we were to think today, FAM, who I just described as a loyal governor, there's another word that we would think of in today's terms. A CEO, the Chief Executive Officer. The point I'm making, folks, is that we really properly understand our own history the American Revolution is not merely a rejection of the king, monarch as the sovereign. It's not only merely a rejection of taxation without representation. Yes, those two things are true, but you know what else the American Revolution is? A people's uprising against illegitimate, unelected, unaccountable corporate power. Yeah. That's the way we have to think about our own history. And so folks, American revolutionaries were not calling for socially responsible king. So today, perhaps, we could do more than just call for more socially responsible corporations. You know, I'm sick and tired of talking and hearing about asking corporations to be responsible, or even more disgusting, good corporate citizens. There's no such thing as a corporate citizen. Only human beings are citizens. Right? right, right. And I used to say that the American revolutionaries weren't calling for a more socially responsible king, but that's True, but only if we understand that those people who would become revolutionaries about 10 to 15 years before the revolution actually flourished were actually writing letters to the king that went something like this. Oh, dear Father King, we, your humble and obedient children, come before you on bended knee to ask that you intervene on our behalf because your royal governor is passing laws that are unfair, and Parliament are passing laws that are unfair. Not just taxation without representation, but unfair business law and trade law. 
by the way, can anybody guess what percentage of the English Parliament owned shares of the East India Company at this time? 100%. Things that make you go, hmm. So, Almighty oh, Father King, we come before you to ask that you intervene on our behalf, O oh, gracious and mighty one. It was the most sniveling, groveling, obsequious language that you can imagine. And in one decade, those people found the courage to stop the boot kissing, to actually stand up, and in the words of King for a different generation, to find some steel for their backbone, to put their shoulders back, to put their chin up and look directly at the king. And where did the king claim cultural authority? God. And look behind the king and see the most powerful military the world had ever assembled and said, you're done, get out, we're doing it different. And let me tell you something, folks, that process, it can only be properly said and understood as an exercise of political self-respect. Because you see, standing up against power as an individual, that's an amazing thing, and it should be applauded, but if one person stands up against illegitimate power, one of two things will happen. That person will either be completely ignored and it will be irrelevant, or that person will be crushed. That's what happens. You see, the genius is, the sweet spot, the, the part that makes us a quiver with anticipation is if one person stands up and somebody else stands up and she and he knows that their sisters and brothers are standing up everywhere. And folks, what I'm describing when that happens, it's called a movement. And look out, folks, there's a movement coming in the United States of America today and it's a democracy movement. Yeah. And it's an incredible movement. So, okay. We know the king gets thrown out, and a new charter is going to be used to create a new government, the supreme law of land. The charter that describes how our government is supposed to operate is called Constitution. the Constitution. How many people here have read the U.S. Constitution? Raise your hands. Oh, look at all those hands. That's good. So y'all read my papers, okay? <laughs> see if I get this more or less right. I will tell you when you read the Constitution, what you will see in big picture it are two principal actors. The first actor is the most important actor. In fact, it's so important, it's the first three words of that document. <laughs> we the people. All I have to do is put my hand to my ear and people across the country will say, as you did, in unison, we the people. That's because those are hallowed words in this country and they should be. Because you see, we the people come together in order to create government. Let's be clear about something, folks. We, the people, create government. Government does not pre-exist us. Government depends upon us to create it. Going further, we, the people in this document, are described and understood as being free and sovereign. And what does the word sovereign mean? Rulers. We have the authority to rule ourselves. Government is not sovereign. Government does not rule us. In fact, to the contrary. Government is subordinate and accountable. Government is subordinate to whom? The people. Government is accountable to whom? The people. That's got a ring to it. I kind of like how that's going. Let's continue. We the people are free and sovereign because we have legal rights. Government does not have rights over the people ever. Government only has duties. And the interchange between rights and duties powerful and profound. I want to be clear about something. It means if I have the right to do something, it means I can do it and I don't need anybody's advanced permission. I don't need your permission. I don't need the group's permission. I don't need the city of Tampa's permission. I don't need the state of Florida's permission. I don't need the United States federal government's permission. Look, y'all, I'm from Texas. I don't even need my mama's permission. <laughs> if I can do something as a matter of right, it means I can damn well do it. And even further, if government tries to take away my right, even with a democratically enacted law that went through some sort of majoritarian process, it can't be legitimately done. That's how powerful rights are. Duties is really the corollary to that. If you have a duty, it means you can be compelled to do something even if you don't want to do it. That's what it means to owe a legal duty. And where might these government duties come from? Well, one way to understand that 
is to remember that all power resides with the people. All political power resides with the people. In fact, the four words power to the people were not just a Black Panther Party chant. They were also an American Revolutionary chant. And it's a chant that almost every movement worth its salt really comes to understand. And the Black Panthers were particularly impressive to me because this was a group of people who were being systematically repressed and abused and were coming together in their own communities to actually try to exercise power, not just try, but actually to exercise power. And when they would gather together, they would start every meeting, the meeting facilitator or leader would say those four words, the group would say it back to him or her, and then go, they'd go about their business. And that's because power to the people are magic words. And to demonstrate that, I'm going to invite folks, if you're willing to do it, let's just try it together. I'll say four words and ask you to repeat them back. I'll say power to the people. Power, power to the people. people. Let's do it again. Power to the people. Power to the people. One last time. Power to the people. Power to the people. Oh, I love it. And you know what? So do you. I wish, I wish you were sitting where I'm standing, where you could see each other. You're all beaming. You're all so happy right now just by saying collectively those four words. Power to the people, right? And you know why? Because it's a beautiful thing. The concept of recognition that we, the people, have the power to create our society is a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a magical thing. And it's something that we should recognize. We should cherish it. We should celebrate it. And let me ask this question, folks. What is the population of Tampa Bay, Florida? One million? Two million. Okay, so I will relish the idea that in this Tampa Bay, the two million souls that are actually living within that political jurisdiction have all the political power. That's a wonderful thing. But let me tell you something, folks. I do not want to go to the meeting of two million people where the decision is made about where to put the stop signs. <laughs> Think about it. Yes, it's true that we the people have all of the power, but we delegate a certain amount of that power to government. Why would we do that? We delegate a certain amount of power so that government can perform the duties that we have told government to do. And that's all the power government has. They don't have any more power other than that power that we delegate them in order to perform and discharge the duties that we want them to do. And I think that that's an amazing thing to understand. Think of the U.S. Constitution as the social contract. Have you all heard of the social contract, right? So this is basically the way we want our society to operate. And the U.S. Constitution should codify the social contract. It should create the mechanism by which we'll do those things. And we the people who have all the power will delegate enough power to government to perform the duties that we want them to do. They are our public servants. They serve the public. And... Even as they discharge their duties, the one thing that government can never do is violate a person's rights. This is a very profound idea. Think of it this way. In our private realm, we have rights that are absolutely sacrosanct that can never be violated. And there is a public component to recognize it's not just about our civil liberties, but there is also a communitarian ethos at play in the U.S. Constitution. I look at this document and I think, wow, that's profound. That's brilliant. That's beautiful. We the people have all the power. We delegate a certain amount of power to government, but only enough power to perform the duties that we want them to perform, and they are always accountable and subordinate to us and to the public interest. But even as they go about making the laws, they can never violate a minority's rights or an individual's rights. Isn't that beautiful? Don't you love it? We should try that in this country. I think this would work. And I'm not even joking, folks. We have never actually experienced this form of government. Notwithstanding what Mrs. Armstrong and your fifth grade teacher told you, we've never actually experienced it. Before, because before I go one second further waxing poetic about how brilliant and beautiful the U.S. Constitution is, time out. Somebody tell me what year the Constitution is uh, ratified and becomes the supreme law of the land. Nicely done. we got a good crowd here. 1789. 1789. 1789 is actually 
The year that the Constitution is drafted, by the way, the Bill of Rights isn't even added until 1791, two years later. But 1789, the document becomes the supreme law of the land. Why do I put that date certain up there? Because I now have a very important question to ask you. In 1789, who was we the people? Remember that to be a person means that you have the ability to assert rights under law. White men who own property, landed property, right? All three of those are very important characteristics. In other words, if you're not white, you're not legally a person, according to this document in 1789. If you're not a man, you're literally not a person with rights under law, according to this document. And in fact, if you're a white man and you don't own sufficient property, you are not a fully functioning citizen with full rights under law. Uh, let me ask this question. In 1789, what percentage of the adult U.S. population do you think was actually legally a person? What percentage? 20 percent? 25 percent? 10 percent? Folks, you are not sufficiently cynical. The answer, literally, 5 percent. Literally, 5 percent of the adult human beings living in the new United States of America was a fully functioning legal person uh, according to the state laws of those 13 new states. Another way to express this percentage, of course, 95% of the adult human beings were not legally persons, which means that as beautiful as this framework is, and it is a beautiful framework, as beautiful as this framework is, in its reality, the founding of this country is a founding violence. It's obviously a founding violence against the indigenous who were already here and were subject to intentional, deliberate genocide. And that is the truth and it needs to be told. And it's a founding violence against the Africans who were brought at the barrel of a gun with the point of a spear and forced to build this country with slave labor. Barack Obama occupies a White House that was built by enslaved Africans. That truth needs to be told. It's also a founding violence against women. Because it's not just that women couldn't vote. I mean, that's the least of it. Women couldn't even own property. Women were property by any reasonable understanding of that word. And it's a founding violence against most of the white men who were brought as either indentured servants themselves or were treated as second-class citizens because they were not sufficient property holders. In fact, no less a historian than the late, great Howard Zinn, may the goddess rest his soul, Howard Zinn said, American history can be seen and understood as a series of struggles by actual human beings to be defined as persons with rights under our Constitution. That's so important, I'm going to say it again, because I really want us to come to terms with that. The entire history of the United States can be seen and viewed and understood as a series of struggles and social movements to have actual human beings defined as persons with constitutionally protected rights. So some people might say, all right, Cobb, you got a scathing indictment against empire of 500 years ago. But hey, man, we got rid of slavery. Women can vote. It's all good. <laughs> to which I'd say, oh, contraire, mon frere. It's not all good. It's not good at all. And we know that it's not good. And a big reason that we've got a problem now is because of the transnational corporation and how it operates. And so I'll ask, let's put the corporation into this framework. Has this framework been helpful about how our Constitution is supposed to operate? Yeah. I'm so glad. And so in order to understand where the corporation should go in such a framework, I'll ask this question. How do you create a corporation in Florida today? File paperwork for the Secretary of State. File paperwork with the Secretary of State and include with your paperwork a check for $50. Yeah. 